Hi, everybody. We're going to get started in just a minute. But while we're waiting, uh, it'd be real helpful if you can answer that uh, couple of demographic questions that are on the screen, and you, you have to scroll down to get to all of them. But um, if you could do that, uh, that would be very helpful. Thank you. We still have folks joining, so I'll give it another uh, minute or so, and then we'll get started formally. Again, if you're just joined, please uh, answer the demographic questions that are on the screen now, and um, you have to scroll. There's three total questions. Okay, I think we'll get started. Welcome, everybody. This is a webinar from the IES USA on the use of resistance tests and managing antiretroviral therapy failure in people with HIV. I'm Mike Sag from the University of Alabama. This from this is, uh, I, I think and uh, joining me today are uh, very uh, distinguished panelists, uh, Dr. Connie Benson from the University of California, San Diego. Dr. Monica Gandhi from University of California, San Francisco, Dr. Raj Gandhi from Harvard Medical School in Boston, and Dr. David Spock from University of Washington. So we've got some very nice geographic diversity. In fact, Dr. Raj Gandhi is coming all the way to us from Scotland. So it's really uh, great to have everybody here. Thanks to all of you for joining, and thanks to the panelists for uh, helping us out. We're just going to have a case-based discussion, uh, and we're going to cover a lot of topics, so let's dive right into it. We have a few introductory slides. Um, this is the uh, financial relationships uh, uh, the web board. Uh, these are the folks who help come up with the topics and oversee the activities. Next. Uh, these are my uh, conflicts for today, as well as our panelists, you can read those, and it also will be uh, available on the web. Next. CME is provided by the IAS USA. Uh, it's accredited from the Council for Continuing Med Medical Education to provide CME for physicians, but it also uh, designates uh, uh, coverage for nursing and for pharmacists. Next. So um, 1.5 CME credits for physicians and uh, you can get ABIM maintenance of certification points. There's 1.5 nursing contact hours, 1.5 pharmacotherapy credit and 1.5 pharmacy contact hours, which translates into 0 0.15 CEUs. Uh, coming up, there's a few more webinars that will talk about perhaps even at the end, but the one that's coming up in November is for those folks who are kind of new to HIV, uh, kind of a 101 um, uh, primer, if you will, uh, for uh, those just starting. Our grant support is given uh, to the organization ISUSA in general to support webinars and in live um, uh, seats, uh, et cetera, that's, those are our funders, and they do not have any um, input on what the topics are, the speakers, or the type of uh, discussions that we have. 
Um, you'll see poll questions coming up as we did at the very beginning uh, that you can answer as the questions come around from the cases. Um, if you have questions, very important to put it in the Q&A. You'll see at the bottom of the Zoom screen, there's also a ch chat, but the Q&A is where the questions will go. That's why I'll be pulling the questions. So if you put it in the chat, it's unlikely that I'm going to see it. So please um, just put all the questions in the Q&A section. We'll get to as many of them in real time as we can. Next. All right, so we're getting ready to start here. Uh, I will uh, share my slides um, right here. And off we go. So um, let's dig in. Um, we've just talked about that. Learning objectives are to identify antiretroviral therapy failure uh, and subsequent treatment options in those with HIV, uh, entering their first regimen as well as those on second regimens and beyond, when and how to use resistance tests in those settings, and designing an effective regimen for multidrug resistance. So here's a pretest question. Uh, just real quickly, a 30-year-old woman presents to care. Uh, she was diagnosed uh, five years ago. Um, she is asymptomatic with active injection drug use. Her initial lab values at a HIV RNA level of 128,000, CD4 count of 150. She started on TDF, intracetabine, and ropivirine with intermittent adherence. Now she returns that her viral load is 12,000, CD4 count of 250. Genotype shows both a 184 and a K65R. What is the least likely to work in this setting? Go ahead and vote. And we'll see where we are. I should set my phone up to play some music, I guess. Do that kind of thing. All right, let's see what we've got. All right. So the majority picked um, Zadovidine, and we'll be covering this, and we'll get to that answer. Um, next is a 55-year-old man referred to you for evaluation, and he had been on multiple regimens in the past. I'm not going to read the entire question, the bottom line is he was he was treated with a number of these agents that you can see, but we don't have any access to his prior resistance tests. So you're now want to switch him to something more modern from his um, uh, current regimen. And the question is, would you get a cellular DNA genotypic re resistance test in this setting, is it indicated here? Go ahead and vote. Would you order that test? Okay, just two choices, so let's see what we have. All right, so 66% would, and again, we'll get to this in the middle of the cover. So, so um, lots of resources. I'm just going to throw these out because these slides uh, will be made available through the website. Uh, later on, but there's the ISUSA guidelines that Dr. Raj Gandhi led, uh, and it's a very nice resource. It's available on the ISUSA website. There's also uh, a little bit older guidance uh, from the ISUSA from a panel um, on resistance testing um, that's been we it's been updated frequently, but. Um, most recently, January 2018. And from that and from that same group, there are access to uh, maps, if you will, for uh, the testing, uh, interpreting the test for genotypes. But if you don't, aren't comfortable doing that yourself, the Stanford database is a wonderful resource. Um, that's the web link, HIVDB Stanford EDU. Um, and you can plug in your, your resistance uh, results, and it will give you a virtual phenotype of sorts where they interpret and make suggestions. Now, the general rules for resistance testing, and we're going to be applying these in the cases, are that a viral load of greater than 500 in general is required, but we'll talk about uh, some uh, exceptions to that. 
Uh, the current guidelines rep do recommend getting a genotype as part of a basic screening as you're evaluating somebody before the antiretroviral therapy is started. Following failure of a first or second regimen, genotype is also recommended, uh, along with the history to uh, make the next regimen next regimen as optimal as possible. After the third or fourth regimen, you might get an HIV phenotype, and we'll talk about that in addition to the genotype. When there's discordance between a genotype and a phenotype, the genotype generally is a little bit more sensitive. And resistance mutations occurring from earlier regimens may not actually be detected by the tests that occurred obtained at the same time. And also remember that if there's been more than four weeks or so since the patient stopped the regimen, a lot of times the viral pool or population reverts to wild type. All right, so let's dig in. I'm going to give you a question just to kind of orient you to what is going on. Uh, the question being, should I check for integrase resistance as well as pro protease nuke and non-nuke prior to starting? So 45-year-old woman's referred to you for evaluation. She was diagnosed two weeks ago. Uh, her HIV RNA is 36,000, CD4 count 150, an unknown source of HIV. Would you want to send a resistance panel and also check the integrase resistance prior to uh, starting treatment? Go ahead and vote. Again, this is yes, no, not sure. So we'll make this a relatively short response time. Trust me, there's going to be some that we need a little bit longer time on. So uh, most people say no. Um, I'm going to just use first names because we have two Dr. Gandhis. And uh, so, Monica, I might start with you. Is this something that you would do um, in this setting? Yeah, you know, we're very fortunate um, that we have the availability of NCD resistance genotyping on our standard panels. And I would do it. It is recommended um, to, in this case, uh, this is not worldwide. Um, and I do understand why it isn't recommended worldwide. I'd be most worried about NNRTI resistance worldwide. And even though this is rare, we still do um, integrase inhibitor testing since Raltegavir has been out since 2008 um, prior to starting. And, and how often are you seeing it de novo in a patient like this? Actually, to be very fair, we've had um, over the last year, Two, it was clearly a cluster, but we had N155H being transmitted. And so it's that random cluster of transmission events that made us realize we couldn't use um, uh, some in integrase inhibitors. So it, it did happen. It's just rare. It's rare. Um, David, um, how about at UW and in, in, in your educational activities? Are you recommending that now? So in our experience, we've not routinely been doing these at the University of Washington through our Harbor U Madison clinic. We have to order the integrase as a separate panel, so essentially doubles the cost. And in the HHH guidelines, a lot of other resources, it's not routinely recommended because of the still the very low background integrase resistance. It would be certainly something I'd love to have if it was routinely kind of like the situation Monica's describing where it's incorporated in, but the way we send out a resistance panels, we have to order it separately. So we do not do it routinely. Yeah. And I think it really depends on the site. Uh, so at our place, we're not doing it either. Um, so it really depends on what you're seeing in your local environment. I think the WHO and others recommend that when the community resistance starts to approach 1% or so, um, then they recommend it. So it's going to vary and it's an individual choice. So um, uh, I think it's an emerging topic and uh, something that uh, uh, we'll find out more. Uh, probably, uh, like usual, San Francisco's kind of out in front on a lot of things. So I'm glad you, uh, you defended uh, what you're doing there, Monica. So let's move on. The next question is about a case of um, a patient who has an M184V at baseline. So this is a 34-year-old, 30-year-old woman, newly diagnosed uh, viral load in CD4, you can see there, and tests come back with a B5701 that's negative, and the genotype shows us M184V. Uh, there's no uh, prior history uh, of significance, and uh, she doesn't plan to become pregnant right now. Uh, and so, okay, to start therapy, now you can see what I meant by there's a whole bevy. This will take a little bit longer, but the, in the setting of an M184V, 
um, what would you choose? Uh, and we'll have a discussion about that. Uh, go ahead and vote now. We'll give it about eight seconds. Okay, let's see what the group said. Okay, so 63% despite the M184V are going to go with something that contains 3TC. And that's generally the rule. There's a few folks who go for a non-nuke, meaning no nucleoside regimen like the Dietegravir. Um, Raj, what do you think in, in this setting? Yeah, I, I would agree with what the... Um... The majority of the people um, voted for, and I have been influenced a lot by three different trials that have come out recently. I'll, I'll mention them briefly, and I think we might come back to them. Uh, prior to these trials, I think there was it was I was a little less confident with um, uh, TDF, let's say TAF FTC Bictegravir or um, uh, TDF FTC Dolgitegravir, but I think either of those two would be quite reasonable in this setting. Um, so. In people who are not suppressed, first of all, um, because that's harder to get people suppressed when they're not suppressed, uh, two studies gave us some confidence with uh, tenofovir, uh, 3TC or FTC, and dalgitegravir, bictegravir. One was a study called Nadia, which looked at people who were failing in NRTIs. A lot of them, 86% of them, had M184V. And in that study, people who got tenofovir with 3TC and either dalgitegravir or Booster Durunivir did very, very well. Over 90% of them got suppressed. A, a second study, um, also in people failing an NNRTI called D2F, got very similar results. So I, I think that's why many of the, the audience voted for a uh, uh, big tagavir or dollar tagavir regimen with TAF or um, TDF and 3TC or FTC, and I would agree. Um, and then lastly, a study that's informative called 2SD looked at people who were already suppressed. So they're already suppressed um, on a PI-containing regimen, but it was done in Africa, and all of these people were on a PI because they had failed NN NNRTIs. And again, a lot of M184V would be anticipated. And again, dalgitegravir plus two nucleosides did well. So I'm now comfortable using dalgitegravir plus um, tenofovir FTC or Bictegravir plus Tino for FTC and people like the, the patient Mike's presenting to us. Yeah. And Connie, do you uh, agree with that or you have a, another opinion? No, I think now Raj has outlined the salient studies and I think they're all pretty um, convincing that you can adequately treat an isolated M81 or 184B mutation in individuals with a standard dose of our current regimens, including 3TC or FTC. So I think I feel quite comfortable with that. Okay. And maybe um, I'll just add this study that Mike has up is, is a fourth study. Um, again, once you're suppressed, this is really showing quite clearly that you can keep people suppressed with, with one of these regimens, but I'll, I'll let Mike walk through this. Right. Okay. So um, David, yeah, the only other point I want to make is that we've gotten very comfortable with this with a high, you know, Bictegravir or Dolutegravir as the anchor drug. So for clinicians out there, I just want to make the distinction. If you're using an NNRTI as your anchor drug, like Ropivirine or Favarins, I think most of us wouldn't feel comfortable or as comfortable, certainly, with an M184V. And if our backbone, if we were using a Bacavir lamivudine, there's a whole different, I think, circumstances there. So I think the comments that we're making, I think, are really with the caveat that you've got a high-level barrier to resistance integrase, BIC or TA or BIC or dolutegravir, and your backbone is some form of tenofovir as part of the backbone. At least that's my take on all this. Yeah, no, you're right, David. That's a great point. And that's kind of why the, for those of us who've been around a while, uh, it used to be we tried to uh, dance around the M184V, especially with regard to uh, 3TC or FTC. And now with the stronger, as you point out, uh, strand transfer, trans strand transfer integrase inhibitors we do that well let's make it a little bit more Can i just add one thing yeah. is that there's been this kind of push sometimes um by some that in tango and salsa with dolotegavir and 3tc the dolotegavir and 3tc still maintain suppression with an m184v i would not do that um we don't know the sustainability of that 
that has been kind of a message sometimes that's been put out about Dolotegavir 3TC, Dolotegavir, you know, nothing should be monotherapy. So I really would um, dissuade any messaging about that. Right. That's a really key point. Thank you. All right. Well, let's make it a little more complicated and challenging. This was one of the pretest questions. Uh, so I, we don't have to spend as much time presenting it. This is the the woman who had been on TDF, FTC, well, Piverine, uh, not taking the drugs regularly. She comes in with virologic failure and the genotype uh, while she's on this regimen um, shows both mutations present. So what would you choose at this point? Uh, we already asked this, but let's see if anybody's changed their mind. Um, it's uh, This is a little bit more broad group of choices than what we gave at the pretest. Some really good options, I think, and some maybe not as good. So let's go ahead and vote. Okay. So it looks like uh, a lot of folks stood with um, FTC and TAF as a nucleoside backbone, uh, despite the M184V. Um, five percent with went with zidovudine, which is a little bit less than what we saw earlier. And interestingly, uh, uh, about twenty five when you add it together, thirty three percent of folks went with a regimen that was um, non-nucleoside in the sense of no nukes, literally, uh, including the injectable. So, um, David, let's uh, hear your take on this. I mean, it used to be that anytime we saw K65R, we need jerk to give uh, zidovudine. Yeah, I totally have changed my approach to this over the last several years based on the data and especially the studies that, that Dr. Gandhi just mentioned. Mm -hmm. So I used to always, you know, use a four drug regimen if I saw a K65R, but based on the data that's come out, I now would feel very comfortable again with sort of very similar approach with Bic TAF FTC or Dolutegavir TAF FTC. Um, I also think the option with boosted darunavir is very likely to also be effective. I just in general, we use less boosted PIs for all the other you know reasons we don't use them with drug interactions and so forth. So I just will say, I think I've really changed my approach on this. The, the only caveat to mention is that the one patient I'd be a little bit concerned about is maybe somebody who's going into this with a really high viral load. You know, if you go back and look at the Nadia study, there are, as you're probably going to outline, a few people who did break through. And when they did, they had significant integrase resistance. And the number was something like four people at 48 weeks and around nine people at 96 weeks. So that's a low percentage overall. Um, you know, we're still dealing with only several percent. But I think if I was going to be with an individual who wanted to be very, very conservative. That would be the only one caveat with this is the rare breakthroughs, there were significant integrase resistance. Yeah, and these are the data from Nadia. Um, I, I, a couple of questions related came in about in this in this setting plus the setting of just an N1E4V. What about, I think you alluded to this, that uh, uh, Dalutegavir 3TC um, not not wise in this setting, Raj? No, I, I think as Monica said, if you've got the M184V, Dalutegra yeah. 3C is too fragile, wouldn't use it. You're essentially giving monotherapy. I think this is a, I would like to kind of reiterate the message that, that David was saying, which is that um, you can use Dalutegra plus Tenofir and 3TC. Um, you should probably be aware, though, that there's this 4% um, rate of um, resistance emergence. There was no resistance in the boosted Darunavir group. So if you want to be especially careful, um, maybe they have an extremely low CD4 count, maybe they have a, a very, very high viral load, then you might go with that um, Tenofovir FTC and boosted Darunavir uh, option. Or you could use a, an option of a boosted Darunavir plus Dalyutegvir. There are now data in treatment and, and people who are not virologically suppressed, that D2F study that I mentioned before, that, that support that as an alternative as well. So um, it depends a little bit on the particulars of the patient. Do they need a, you know, a, a, um, a regimen that doesn't involve a PI for whatever reason? Um, is there tolerability issues? But yeah, both of these, all, all of these regimens are now good ones, uh, the ones that we've mentioned. A 
Connie. Yeah, and I, I was going to make a similar point to the one that Raj just made, but um, highlighting the fact that this, you know, there's a little obviously more forgiving uh, scenario if the patient's suppressed at the time you switch, and this patient was not, still had a viral load of 12,000 copies. And the other issue, um, one of your choices on, I think, would be a pretty wrong choice, and that would be cabotegravir ralpivirine, since she failed on a ralpivirine regimen and was not virally suppressed at the time you're switching therapies. So that's probably among the choices one you wouldn't want to use. Monica. Um, so uh, two additional points from what excellent points that people have already made. Um, one is that this that we reached for cydovidine um, prior to this with the K65R because we thought the K65R conferred hypersusceptibility to AZT. And I think this once and for all um, told us that we didn't have to use AZT with the K65R. And I thought that was really helpful, probably tolerability, but it, nonetheless, I think it's it's gone. And and how much TDF, even though you think K65R wouldn't work with TDF, um, you know, there really is really strong evidence with it in STEs that you can use it. We don't actually have the similar data for Bictegravir, just to be fair. The Nadia was with Dolotegravir, but not with Bictegravir. So you're extrapolating. Um, and then the final point I'd make is Emerald um, study, which we didn't talk about, but, um, you know, this is with Durunavir in the face of NRTI resistance. Uh, Durunavir CAB, sorry, Durunavir CoB, TAF, FTC, uh, actually really um, high rates of suppression, even when there were some k 65 bars. So that gives you even more advantage that if you really want to be careful, it's the Darunavir with, with TAF, FTC versus Dolotegavir in someone who has unsuppressed viral load. And um, this person has been started, st was started on Bopibrine, you know, even with a viral load of greater than 100,000, which wasn't what Echo and Thrive would have told us to do. So I think there's too, like Connie said, there's too much underlying questions of resistance. Right. I think um, the surprise to me in this study on Nadia was just the power of these other regimens. The Zidovidine of 85%, you almost could anticipate because of experience with tolerability from going back to 1987, when a lot of us started first using it. So uh, there are some other studies here, um, as you all alluded to. Uh, this one is looking at dolutegravir darunavir that did pretty well, at least compared um, to Darunavir and two nukes. And then, um, so the, the take-home point, I think, for all of this is that we are uh, now seeing data, good, well-done studies that show that, again, as we've emphasized, that the backbones of, uh, and not, I want to be careful how you, the anchor drug of, a, of an inter integrase inhibitor really is a game changer and also the notion of using two together. Uh, Monica, real quickly, if you could comment on the use of injectable cabotegravir, ropivirine, and this woman had been on ropivirine, but there was no demonstrated resistance. How would you put that together? And uh, this is a person who's been having trouble with adherence. I mean, yes, you're asking me because we've been using a lot of cabotegravir, ropivirine in people even with viremia at Ward 86. Okay. And um where I work. And so we we do think more about can we use cabotegravir and ropivirine in someone who has a hard time taking the drugs because maybe it's better to just have something than can't take the drugs. But I agree with Connie that um, though we didn't get an NNRTI ropivirine mutation, just has had so much exposure to ropivirine all this time orally that there's probably something that we don't know. And to be honest, if she couldn't take oral ART, this is going out of limb, but we would put her on, on lenacapavir, cabotegravir, um, real pivoting, and I, we're going to be uh, submitting a case series to Corey about lenacapavir, cabotegravir in these cases. So we're really interested in that combination. Again, if you just can't take oral ART, you can't take it, and we do have lenacapavir. Right. So we're going to get to some of that in a minute. There are a few quick comments in the in the chat, or the sorry, in the questions that uh, WHO is still recommending AZT in this setting. I think they're just waiting for maybe the data to be digested a little more. I suspect that might change in the next year or so. Um, and 
So Mike, there there is a little data that you might want to talk about because there's two questions in the chat about why you couldn't use dolutegravir 3TC. And, you know, in the studies with uh, that two drug combination, most of those data in the presence of, um, were in the presence of a an M184B mutation alone, not in combination with a K65R mutation. And although um, people with a low viral load may still be suppressed with dolutegravir 3TC for a period of time, I would still be a little more worried about the, the exposure with the compromised activity of 3TC, even though um, it may still retain some activity, it, that regimen is weaker and there are other options, so. And I think that I think also, yeah, different I think thoughts. That, right. Um, I think that uh, you have other options. And, and if you do develop a breakthrough on that regimen and you start running the risk of loss of the strand transfer integrase inhibitors, it doesn't seem like in that setting it's really worth the risk. Um, so what do I do with a patient who has detectable, persistently detectable viremia? So this is a 55-year-old guy referred in. He's been uh, treated for a long time, uh, diagnosed 24 years ago. Recently, his viral load is 85, uh, prior value was 62. CD4 count has come up uh, over the years, multiple different regimens like a lot of our patients have had. Now sort of settled down into dolutegravir, boosted darunavir, and 3TC, but you don't have any historical resistance tests available. Uh, would you change his therapy now? Uh, would you just kind of keep him on what he's on? Um, go ahead and vote. Okay, let's see what we got. All right, the majority of people would kind of keep him where he is. Uh, David, do you have a feeling on what to do in this setting? Yeah, I think I just to start off with sort of one basic point. I mean, our, our goal and our target is to try and get people, you know, less than 40, 50 copies. We just feel that's the target goal, I think, across all guidelines is to get people suppressed. Um, I think it's also important to define low-level viremia and virologic failure. And I think in terms of most recent definitions, low-level viremia is typically somewhere hovering between 50 and 200, with virologic failure really being the term when you cross a threshold above 200. So one point with this case is you really are talking about somebody who's hovering with low-level viremia and even on the low end of low end low, low level viremia with you know less than 100 copies so i would feel very comfortable staying the course in this case and really would define this as low level viremia kind of coming back to my comment earlier years ago if i'd seen low level viremia on person on say ropivirine or favarins as the anchor drug i would maybe not so feel so comfortable um, just watching and waiting the only other caveat when i do see low level viremia tend to monitor these people a little more closely. Um, you know, when we see people and they've had suppressed viral loads for years, we're following them, you know, twice a year, three, four times a year, maybe, but not in this case. This is somebody that I wouldn't see twice a year. I'd probably want to keep an eye on this. The last point to make is one good news is, you know, we, we like to have everybody suppress from a transmission standpoint, but most of the data that when they looked at U equals U was really with virologic cutoffs of less than 200. So I think even at this level, there's still probably a very big and profound benefit in terms of transmission, um, reduced risk for transmission. Right. I think even back in the older days, um, we were using viral load in 93, 94, and thought that maybe um, in this setting, like we've had several patients, and this was with nevirapine, so it might fit with what you had seen. Um, intensifying the regimen did not change things. And part of the reason <clears throat> kind of goes back, or actually the whole reason, goes back to this diagram where you have infected cells. And this cycle is really what we're blocking when we use antiretroviral therapy um, out in here. And so um, the question then is, are we getting a complete block 
Uh, and if so, where's the residual virus coming from? And I think there's a lot of evidence now that block is really 100%, even in the setting like this patient. And it's these residual cells up here, the long lasting reservoir cells, if that's what you want to call them, that uh, when somebody who had an initial viral load that was very high, that reservoir is a bit larger than, say, somebody who had a baseline vi viral load of 5,000 or 6,000. And these cells periodically uh, release virus that that doesn't go on to infect a de novo uninfected cell. Um, so this is still blocked, but there's enough uh, virus being spit out of these cells where you can detect it. And we see this commonly changing the regimen won't help, intensifying the regimen won't change it either because the biology uh, really says that these are folks who um, don't need any further antiretroviral therapy. When we get the cure and we get rid of those guys without having to do a bone marrow transplant, then we can readdress that. Speaking of that, let's talk about blips in a sense. This is a 48 year old guy infected for two years. Um, had really nice response to a Bictegravir based regimen, um, remained undetectable until about four months ago, came in for a routine check and he had jumped from 40, less than 40 copies to detectable 91. So brought him back in two months. And not only did it not go back, it went up further, got concerned and then brought him back again. And now he's at 220. Um, and he claims full adherence. Um, and this is a guy I took care of. And I actually believe him. I, I, at least I did believe him. Uh, so the question is, do you believe him? Um, so is it intermittent adherence? Is it occult recreation of drug use where he stops taking medicines every now and then? Um, use of uh, multivitamin, de novo resistance just occurring out of the blue or some Russian bot that came in and messed up the results. Uh, let's go ahead and vote. Okay, let's see how many people went with the Russian bot. A few, okay. <laughs> yeah, I figured, yeah, good for you. Um, all right, so the majority think it's a multivitamin. Um, panel, anybody uh, want to dive into this one? This is a case I actually took, God took care of. Yeah, uh, so... Oh, I'd just like to make one comment, and that's that that I wouldn't really define these as blips. Correct. This is a person who was fully suppressed, had um, three different viral loads obtained sequentially, all of which are rising. And so that's a different situation where you have a, a viral load that goes up and then comes back down and periodically blips over time. So this is much more suspicious for something interfering with the activity of the antiviral therapy and on its way to virologic failure. So whatever the cause, and I agree with the rest of the audience, I, I think exploring the multivitamin issue with and whether it contains cations that are interfering with the integrase inhibitor is an important concept here for someone who otherwise has been fully adherent. But this right. is a different situation than just your average blip scenario. Right. The one thing is I'd say we have these bodybuilders and it's not just multivitamins, but these supplements that people can take um, with protein have a lot of zinc and that cation um, can interfere with that, that INSD um, integration. So ask about um, stuff to make yourself bodybuild. Yeah. So, all right, I don't throw trick questions out there very often. And I, my use of the term blip was deliberate. And uh, Connie, you picked up on it immediately that if we go back to the the parent, whoops, the parent slide here, um, this would have been a blip if it had come back down. So that would have been a blip. It didn't come back down. And that's the point. So I tried to kind of help us define what a blip is. So you've done that nicely. And mm -hmm. The panels picked up very well. This was the true story here was um, I called him and said, have you started anything new? Anything? He said, yeah, yeah. I started this uh, multivitamin four months ago. And I said, do you have it with you? He said, yeah. And I said, read me the ingredients. And it had magnesium and uh, calcium and a few other things. 
and that was the problem. So we got him off the multivitamin and his viral load came right back down. Uh, Raj. Yeah, I wanted to um, obviously I agree with what's been said. Um, the multivalent cations to think of the zinc, the iron, the magnesium, the um, calcium. One thing that sometimes comes up is whether dietary um, calcium has an effect on dolutegravir, bactegravir, yeah. and, and selective calcium. And it really doesn't. It's the supplement, you know, it's the uh, kind of the pharmacologic um, uh, doses of these uh, multivalent cations. And, and also it doesn't matter if you're taking potassium, the, the monovalent cations don't matter. So it's really pharmacologic multivalent cations, dietary is okay. Right. So one of the questions from the audience is, does, uh, do, does U equal U still pertain to people that have, let's say, less than 200 copies? Uh, Monica, I think you've looked into this a lot. Well, um, you know, to coincide with the IAS 2023 meeting, the WHO commissioned a big Lancet review that was published simultaneously with the meeting about um, less than a thousand being associated with essentially negligible forward transmission. And we've always said 200 because opposites attract and the um, partners positive study, those were less than 200. And the data is a little bit less robust, robust between 200 and, and 1,000 because it's more on, it's not these huge um, places where, where people are um, having a lot of condomless sex acts. But I will say that the WHO has been very clear. They put out a brief um, in July of this year saying that they believe less than 1,000 is uh, the cutoff for, for um, not being able to transmit forward. And that is the current guidance from the CD, uh, sorry, from the WHO which is also their cutoff for, for people living with HIV to maintain a viral load yeah. less than 1,000. So it's interesting that that there's differences between CDC and WHO in that way. Well, right. what's it, interesting too is that, that that number actually goes back way back to the original Rakai study that was- uh, that, looking that at, was a lot of the data, yeah, exactly. Yeah, looking at transmission from- uh, Discordant couples. Uh, pardon? It yes, from discordant discordant couples. couples in the Rakai district, and those individuals who had less than a thousand copies didn't transmit to one another. So, I think those data have held up over time, but well, led to the uh, you know celebrations at IS twenty twenty three say zero, and so I, I think it's important yeah. to, to use that thousand. So um, one one uh, one of the questions here is how would you expect the viral load to get a with the cation drug interaction, in other words, what is the what's the uh, process on that? Um, it it has to do with the integrase inhibitor itself, right? And it it inhibits the absorption, is my understanding, uh, from the gut, but it also has intracellular uh, yeah. in, interaction as well. The interface with the with the integrase itself, just like fluoroquinolones, um, magnesium and zinc interface with the fluoroquinolones activity, the same with integrase yep. inhibitors and integrase enzyme. Right. David? Yeah, the only the point I'm going to make, yeah, and that I, I agree with exactly what Monica said, because the integrase has this catalytic triad where usually there's two magnesium molecules, and essentially the what people are taking are competing with that that's, just, that's essential for the integrase binding. Um, but the only other point I would make is I think we all deal with this a lot in the clinic where things aren't going or they don't match up with what's being said. So somebody's saying... They're adherent, but yet the viral load is, is rising. And I think this case should be differentiated from a scenario that we often get asked about. And that's someone says, I'm not missing a single pill, but the viral load goes from undetectable to 50,000. And, and I think that's a case that we see. And usually in that, and we do a resistance test and there's no resistance mutations. And I think I just want to contrast with this, where it seems like there's a very, really good explanation in the scenario I just presented, I think that's usually where somebody has just, for some reason or another, has stopped taking medications altogether. And I think there's a different kind of problem solving that may be needed in that circumstance. But I mean, I'm sure, Mike, you've seen this where you get a number Absolutely. and it goes way up and you just don't see yep. that naturally and biologically happening on an integrase or boosted PI. You're right. That's exactly right. So David, stay with us for this next case here. And uh, we've got a person who's got a discordant CD4 count. I don't know you have talked about this before, but basically it's a woman who gets started on uh, TDFFTC and a boosted uh, darunavir four years ago. 
and her initial viral load was, uh, as you see, but a CD4 count of 80. It's four years later, and she's been persistently undetectable, but the CD4 count has only doubled. That's it. Hadn't gone up any higher. And she's tolerating the drug well, but she's still under 200 CD4 cells. So what would you do here? Let's have poll the audience and see what they say. Keep her on her current regimen. Not going to change. Wouldn't be prudent. I had IL-2. That's fun. Let's let's see what we get. All right. So 71% stayed with it. A few folks would change the regimen. A couple of folks would add IL-2. Well, hmm, that goes back to Yves Levy and uh, uh, Anne-Marie de Lejeune or Deluge, how pronounce her name. Uh, David, what do you think? Well, this is an interesting dilemma that does come up a lot. And I think I've looked at this many, many times and we've tried many different things. We've tried switching regimens. If you look at all the data on this, I think the bottom line is stay the course. If they're on a regimen they're tolerating that doesn't have toxicity, stay the course. The one thing I would say is look at their other meds as there's something that you may be able to get them off of that's marosuppressive, sometimes trimsulfa, you may be able to get them off that, or other marosuppressive agents. You know, you you remember, I remember the IL-2 data, and it looked mm. like, wow, this is great, CD4 counts go up with it, but there was not any clinical benefit at all. And so yeah. I think changing everything around, even if you do something that bumps up the CD4 count 15, 20 points, there's no clinical benefit that's associated with it, at least that I'm aware of. The other thing that I think if you tie in with this, this like leaving it alone, if they're suppressed, is that all the data that's come out in the last several years really indicates having a suppressed fire load really carries the day in terms of risk for OIs. And, you know, you look at the data for stopping pneumocystis prophylaxis, you look at the MAC prophylaxis data of really not being able to need MAC prophylaxis if you're starting someone on therapy and you get them suppressed soon. Um, I just think the data really indicates suppressing the viral load is the primary goal and that we should not be chasing right. a CD4 number. And, and making our <laughs> patients feel comfortable with that, that we're comfortable with it is really important too. Agree. So this goes back to a couple of um, early, like I ca I'll call it early 1990, mid-1990 studies. Uh, the, the point you just made about uh, the virus really is the immunosuppressive agent, it seems to be, that at high levels, it, it, it interferes with function of the immune system. And you know that from a couple of observations. When you give acute therapy, you get iris. It's like the virus comes down the immune system wakes up in essence, and you get that uh, uh, inflammatory response following that. And also, as you alluded to, we don't see, even if the CD4 count is early on 50 or 60, and once the viral load goes undetectable, you don't see MAC like we used to. You don't see CMV disease. Um, and that's because the virus is causing the problem. The other thing that was noticed early on, if this is the normal response, the bottom being uh, viral load coming down and then CD4 counts going up. This is what we typically see. But there are patients who, despite the viral load going down, don't get that bump in the first six weeks. There's a huge difference. Now, notice after that six weeks, the slope of this line is much different than the slope in here. And this slope mirrors it. It's like they don't get this bump in CD4. And that may well be due to redistribution of CD4s that were trapped in lymphoid tissue from the inflammation produced by ongoing replication. You stop the replication, the adhesion molecules, ICAM, VCAM, others are no longer elaborated, those cells come back. Um, and, and that could well be uh, explaining a lot of this. So uh, we've got a little bit more to learn there, but I think the take home clinical point clearly is uh, to not change therapy solely because of that. All right. So could I, I just make that. one more point? I think David did make the point, but um, there's a question in the Q&A about whether you still need to initiate or continue PJP prophylaxis in this patient. And with a fully suppressed viral load, current recommendations are no, you do not. And David explained some of that. It's because of the, the issue with OI prophylaxis 
in more recent studies where people are fully virally suppressed, the risk of developing an OI in that setting is really low to negligible. And although you would traditionally use that CD4 count to monitor in terms of the need for prophylaxis, studies really do not support right. the need for that any longer if you're fully suppressed on a good regimen. Right. Years ago, David Ho said it's the virus stupid. Yes. Around the time of the Clinton campaign back then. Yeah, Raj. Um, the only additional points I wanted to add is um, some of the risk factors for an incomplete CD4 recovery. One is having a low CD4 to begin with. So advanced CD4, yeah. um, advanced AIDS, uh, low CD4, probably because of lymph node fibrosis. You know, as That's you right. get a very low CD4 count, your lymph nodes begin to fibrose. Um, advanced age or older age. Now, this is a young person, so that's not operative here, but she did have a low CD4 count to begin with. And then there are some data um, to suggest that hepatitis C co-infection um, leads to a blunted CD4 rise, probably because of hypersplenism from the hep C and, and hep C cirrhosis. Um, one other med I wanted to throw out in addition to trimethoprim sulfa, which you can stop, as has been said, and this person, she's been suppressed for a few years. Um, is um, steroids. Steroids will lower your lymphocyte count and then will lower your CD4 count. So if she's taking prednisone or or some you know steroid, just make sure that that's not the cause of your of your problem of the low CD4. Right. And then if it suddenly plummets, make sure that there's not lymphoma or something worrisome like that. Yeah. Right. Um. So we have a couple of uh, points. Uh, uh, Manoj Ray is here and. Uh, actually, we're going to get to that scenario later, Manoj. Um, so we ask you about twice a day, Darunavir. Prophylaxis, we talked about this, uh, stopping after uh, a year, even if CD4 count doesn't go below 200, I mean, above 200 um, with viral suppression. Um, and then comments about adherence and uh, the systemic uh, systematic review. And plus, I think folks can scroll through these questions and uh, I think we're addressing most of these. Um, let's move on and talk about uh, a scenario which we commonly see, especially as patients get referred to us. Uh, this is a guy who was referred in 24 years ago, infected, <clears throat> viral load was suppressed, CD4 count was uh, nicely uh, responsive, multiple different regimens, um, and and he's now on a Favarin's based regimen started in 2007 when 90% of the people were on a Favarin's. Um, but now sort of the thought is to modernize the regimen, but there's no historic resistance. Would you order a cellular DNA genotype? Yes, no. Not sure this is uh, the pretest question that we're going to have a little bit of discussion on. Give it about four seconds more. Well, let's see what we got. Okay, it's about a 50-50 split. Um, let's see, who wants to take this? Uh, does it, Would any of you all order that DNA test? Would it be helpful? No. So I, I think the panel is going to say no. <laughs> uh, and anybody want to go through some rationale behind that? And in this case, I, I don't think you need it because you know that this person is almost suppressed on um, an efavirenz to nofavir FTC regimen. So you, you could feel pr quite confident that a integrate um, a bactegavir or dalgitegavir containing regimen with to nofavir FTC would similarly keep them suppressed. So you can modernize this regimen without getting a proviral genotype. But perhaps even more importantly, the proviral genotypes have two problems. One is they, so first of all, they're looking at the DNA rather than the RNA. They're looking at um, resistance mutations in the integrated DNA. They, they miss um, a fair amount of resistance. So one study looked at about 100 people who we knew had M184V. They had it on a historical genotype of uh, electronic document, a piece of paper said they had M184V, but when they did the proviral genotype, only 50 of those people had the M184V. So it's not sensitive or it's, it's not fully sensitive in that case. Right. For M184V, only 50% sensitive. And then the other problem is it's not really validated. You just don't know if the resistance that you find in the DNA is in a defective virus. Remember, a lot of the virus in the DNA is, is defective or it's or it's or or whether it's in replication competence. So those are the two reasons you don't need it and the issue with um, sensitivity and validation. 
Yeah, I think it was pretty, people were pretty excited about it when it first came out. And then as the point you made, Raj, uh, became more obvious, um, the, the fact that you're, you're, you're amplifying something that's oftentimes just a fragment of a virus that really isn't viable. So what's the meaning and the errors of omission, if you will, that you pointed out. So I don't think people are getting this much anymore. Um, it just isn't terribly helpful. And you, like you said, you can go as much from the history and, and the activity of the modern, more modern regimens really overcome that to a large degree. So um, now this is one, I think, is along the lines of what uh, Manoj Raj was asking. Manoj Raj, uh, here we go. So uh, this is a 68-year-old who's been infected for over 20 years and has been recently on a um, twice-daily Darunavir regimen with... Um, TAF, FTC, and Valutegravir. So there you go, uh, Manoj, this is your case. Um, poor adherence to 2015, but on that regimen suppressed for the last seven years. There are distant genotype phenotypes, but generally speaking, would like a simpler regimen. So the question is, what would you do? Would you keep him on his current regimen, or would you just simplify to one of the standard initial therapy strand transfer and integrase inhibitors or some other option, go ahead and vote. Again, more of a simple choice here. Uh, let's go ahead and see what we get. Okay, the majority, uh, 70 some odd percent, would switch to one of the standards. About twenty percent would stay the same. David, uh, what are your what's your opinion on this one? I think you're muted. I think in this case, um, you know, I I want a little bit more information. Can you can you show me the genotype again on this? Sorry, we we don't we did we didn't have one. Um, yeah, I think I would. The person suppressed. We don't have any historical genotypes. Um, no, I can give you that one I just showed if you want it. Um, but uh, no, but I, I, there's remote. So let's. I'll show you I, this. I thought, yeah, just remember. I think you had this. That's why I think I, I didn't know yeah. if you were going to show this in a different order. So right. <laughs> the re the reason is because the genotype's pretty ugly for the darunavir. And if I just heard the case, I probably would have answered it different than knowing what the genotype is. But I think here, clearly, there's not really any benefit of a boosted PI. Um, and there are a lot of NRTI mutations, but, you know, granted, tenofovir is susceptible. So, I mean, yeah. I, I, I think, you know, the person probably would do okay on BICTAF FTC. Um, but let me see what others think about this as well, too. I, I, I would have really mixed feelings about this case. Monica, what do well, you think? It, you know, Connie, yeah. I also had the benefit of looking at Mike's uh, older um, genotype, but I think the the real message here is there really isn't any clinical benefit from continuing the darunavir ritonavir yeah. here. And what other choices you might want to use have to be done within the context of eliminating um probably most of the NNRTIs and PI type regimens. So your choices are going to include recycling some of the NRTIs and using an integrase inhibitor. And I guess the question is, do you add something from one of the other novel classes of drugs that he hasn't seen before? Um, right now, it looks like he's been fully suppressed for a long time on this regimen and it's a regimen without really the benefit of the darunavir, ritonavir twice daily. So I'm not sure you really need to go to one of the other, you know, uh, novel classes of drugs at this point. Right. So I, I think, think I would agree with your audience. I'm, I might try him on BICTAF FTC, and I think he would probably do well on that. Yeah. I think to David's point with this, this is an older genotype, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, phenotype, but notice that this is kind of the point I was going to make 
a lot of times if there's an M184V, which we know knocks out 3TC and FTC for the most part, not completely, by the way, it still has some residual right. activity. You get, you get hyper susceptibility as indicated by the phenotype showing um, this is one, which is basically kind of a wild type. And i uh, sorry, that's 10, but here's one. And it's actually hyper susceptible. So the tenofovir based regimen is going to be a little bit more active, even though the FTC isn't. And you've got full activity of the strand transfer integrase inhibitor. So I think that's the case. So simplifying um, is something we can do. Um, and it's, but you, I think, uh, Connie, as you're alluding to, you can start it, then you follow them kind of carefully to make sure that the viral load does say, stay suppressed. David? Mike, sorry, the only other point I wanted to make, and I thought you were going to go down the pathway of asking us about once daily darunavir versus twice daily darunavir here, and that's where I was going to start to go. And then I realized the genotype on this just shows darunavir is not an option. But somebody was asking about this. And if you go back and look at the ODIN study, essentially once daily darunavir is fine if there are no darunavir associated mutations. You can have other PI mutations but if you have no darunavir associated mutations, that study showed once daily darunavir was just as good. And simplifying, that's a really quick way you can get someone from four pills a day on that part of the regimen to one pill with boosted with darunavir Kobe. I think the interesting question, I'd love to hear what other people say. I think the more complicated question is, what if somebody has one or two darunavir associated mutations and they've been suppressed for a long time. I have to say in our practice, when we've tried to consolidate people down to once daily regimens, we have taken some of those individuals with just one or two DRAMs and, and used once daily, you know, darunavir Kobe in that setting. But I'd love to hear what others say. Well, actually, that was exactly the point I wanted to make is that the ODIN study also um, showed at a HIV resistance meeting something really interesting about once daily, twice daily, but it wasn't actually published, but I have a slide on it that I could, we could send out later. But um, it says exactly what you just said, David, that um, between if you have zero, one or two mutations, OK, at least zero and one, you can get away with once daily. Then they divided it into two and there were a certain amount, 50 percent suppressed with once daily, three. 25% suppressed. Um, and then once you have four or more, and there are four resistance mutations here, uh, then you can't use ritonavir at all. Uh, sorry, darunavir at all. So I think it was really reasonable of this physician to, to use darunavir, ritonavir, BID until we got to the fourth mutation, and then it's gone. Yeah. Okay. Well, as you sense, we're starting to get into um, some of the more uh, challenging resistance questions, which I think was the real attraction to this whole webinar. So what do we do in the setting of virologic failure and poor adherence? Uh, anybody ever seen a case like that? Okay. So this is a 40-year-old, 41-year-old uh, who's diagnosed in 2010. Initial viral load was low and viral load was in the <clears throat> 160,000 range. Wild-type genotype initially started on uh, like a lot of folks, as I mentioned already, a Favarin's based regimen had initial response, uh, but had come off of the medicine and uh, came back with a spiking viral load. He restarted uh, the same regimen, was using meth, had trouble, and in uh, uh, about a year ago uh, had failure, virologic failure, and had a K103N and a couple of other um, new. Uh, non new changes, but then had one protease, uh, L10I, that was it. But started on BICTAF FTC, which by everyone's agreement would work, should work, um, but had poor visit adherence, poor medication adherence, and on the BICTAF FTC um, had a viral load that was starting to creep up um, and were able to get a resistance assay that showed a couple of integrase inhibitor uh, mutations. Uh, so now what? Um, we can, we just sort of address some of the questions of darunavir. Uh, so this is in most of the choices, all of them, in fact, other, unless you choose F. But then what else would you have in the regimen if that's where you're going to go? Let's go ahead and vote. A little more complicated. Okay, let's see what we got. All right, no 
obvious, clear consensus, including 15% of people who said, well, if it's R5-tropic, use some Maraviroc. I think the concept there is use active drugs. Uh, Maraviroc is twice daily, but um, uh, let's see. Uh, Connie, what are you thinking about as you look at this case? Well, I think, uh, as you said, it's more complicated. Um, if you had or thought you were seeing very limited integrase inhibitor mutations, ones that weren't going to have a huge effect on dolutegravir activity, you could go to boosted darunavir and dolutegravir twice daily with TAF-FTC. In this case, it looks like he's a failure on Bictegravir, um, at least if I'm remembering your case well. And he's got a pretty um, scary looking resistance mutation. So that probably wouldn't be one of your choices. So it, now I think you're into the category of using um, combinations of other novel classes of drugs that he may not have been exposed to previously. Um, re maybe recycling the the NRTIs, the darunavir cobicistat, and maybe in this case, Maraviroc makes sense. Um, Ropivirine and Duravirine are potential users, but you've got some NNRTI mutations that are starting to look scary there too. And so maybe those aren't going to be the best choice. So I think you're into the realm of some of these other things. I'll be interested in what Monica has to say, because this might also be a situation where um, with the approval of lenacapavir in the context of um, multi-drug resistant or heavily previously treated patients, that those studies looked pretty good. If you could combine lenacapavir with um, one or more or two or more fully active drugs, you have pretty good chances of being fully suppressed. So those are kind of the areas I'd be thinking yeah. about. Monica, what do you think? Well, yeah, I mean, I think of, uh, I think that Raj will go over next because I just, I think it's really important to point out that the R263K is one of those mutations that seems to be associated with bactegravir resistance. And we just don't have very much on bactegravir resistance because it has a high genetic barrier, but there are breakthrough cases with the R263K. And I think it'd be really important to go through those. So I almost take away bactegravir now um, uh, because of the R263K. And so then when I think of really multi-drug resistant patients, I think of four drugs. I think of Ibaluzumab and Maraviroc and Fostemsevir and Lenacapavir. And Maraviroc can be once a day if you combine it with a um, CYP3A4 um, inhibitor like Kobe or um, Ritonavir. So that that makes it a little less burdensome because you're right, it's otherwise BID. And then Fostemsevir is hard because it's BID. And Ibaluzumab is really hard because it's IV. And Lenacapavir is looking good and it's only every six months. Um, but uh, after oral loading doses, um, at least in a really small study, the Capella trial. So that's when I start reaching for these other medications. Right. So th that was kind of the point of this case was to point out the R263K. That's one of the ones that sort of gets your attention right away. Um, Raj, I think you might have sent me this slide. Um, uh, or you, No, that's my it's on the slide. Oh, that's a great okay. slide. I um, I. You know, if you just go on the resistance, you might be fine with boosted Runavir plus TAF FTC. You may want to hedge your bets and have one more drug, as people are saying. Um, but at least what we know from his genotype is he's got just the L10 mutation in Proteus, which shouldn't do anything. So Proteus inhibitors are good. Um, it looked like, and maybe Mike, if you don't, if you can easily scroll back, it looked like he should have susceptibility. I think probably one more back. Um, if you look at his reverse transcriptase mutations, you know, he has M184V, but um, beyond that, he should have susceptibility to, to nofavir. Right. Um, so, maybe hypersusceptibility. Uh, yeah, maybe hypersusceptible, as you were saying. So that might be enough. Now, if, if you wanted to, and I certainly wouldn't I mean, make sense to try to get a very robust regimen, you could potentially add Duravirine. Um, Duravirine should actually have some activity. If you put this into Stanford, you'll, you know, there's still some activity of, of um, the reverence, so that's a possibility. Um, 
The 263K right. mutation does knock down um, Bictegravir, does knock down Dalditegravir by about twofold or so. Um, so maybe you could get away with twice a day um, Dalditegravir. So I think you've got good options. And then finally, for sure, Lenacapavir, you know, is going to work. And and as was said, it's every six months. So I would probably use TAF FTC, boosted Runavir, and then depending on concern, either Abdurabrine, Lenacapavir. Yeah, one concerns. of the one of the questions, there's a couple here. One is about how did the L10I arrive? And that probably was transmitted, I would guess. It there was no reason for it to have been there otherwise. Um and then Fostemzavir, uh, yeah, I mean, it probably yeah. would have activity. The, the the challenge that I find in all of these types of cases is the underlying issue of poor adherence and especially someone who's intermittently using methamphetamine and it's hard enough to keep one pill once a day and now you got twice a day regimens of multiple pills um unless they've sort of found religion if you will um it 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 doesn't bode well it's a tough situation that we've all faced but that's what this uh, whole webinar is kind of about uh, so Raj, let me keep you on the line here for this one. This is a regimen who, uh, someone who was on prep and the regimen failed, was on TDFFTC for pre-exposure, missed doses, and comes in with acute seroconversion, basically. And now what would you do? Um, got your choices there. Go ahead and vote. Okay, let's see what we got. Yep. Yeah, I think the audience is right on. You've got good choices here. Um, so he's failed TDF-FTC in terms of um, acquiring HIV. When that happens, it's still fairly uncommon to have resistance. Um, M184V, for example, is, is not very frequent in that setting. Um, Sometimes if you inadvertently treat someone who already has HIV, um, you don't, for example, recognize that if they have acute HIV with uh, TDF-FTC, then you can get um, M184V, but it's not that common of a resistance mutation in, in this setting. And K65R, which theoretically you could also get because he's um, had some uh, tenofovir exposure, is even less likely. So I think TAF FTC Bictegvir, while you're waiting the one week or so, however long it takes you to get your genotype, is a very, very reasonable uh, way to start because um, resistance is unlikely. If he has resistance, it's most likely going to be M184V. And, and we talked earlier in the webinar about um, that particular combination for for that setting. So I think right. I think you're on solid ground with, with should, that. Should of course, be okay. the other let's, choices work as well, but I don't think we need D. I think D is probably... Yeah, necessary in this overkill. Case. No, and I think overkill. we could extrapolate back from what we said earlier, like you said, from the uh, cases of people treated. So they're probably OK. Let's spice it up a bit. And let's say he was on cab and, and had virologic breakthrough. Same story. Now what? <laughs> Go ahead and vote. We don't have a resistance panel yet. This is acute seroconversion. You want to treat today. What are you going to do? Okay, let's see what the audience says here. All right. Um, Raj, let me stick with you for the moment, and then I'm going to expand out. Um, yeah, here I would feel uncomfortable using TAF FTC, but Tegra, I would probably go to option number B. I might substitute in TAF for the TDF, but I'd probably go ahead and use TAF FTC uh, boosted Darunavir until I got my genotype back. I think there have been instances of um, people who have acquired HIV on cabotegravir who have developed integrase inhibitor resistance. Sometimes they've even had delayed recognition of their HIV. And so here I would um, um, steer towards uh, the boosted PI regimen. Right. And then these are the data. Um, I think that we're so, Monica, you want to uh, comment on this a little bit? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, the WHO has endorsed Cavitegavir for worldwide prevention because it was really exciting to see not just um, the same, but superiority of 
long acting cabotegravir every two months um, compared to oral TDF FTC in both women and men. Uh, and though long acting cabotegravir and ropivirine hasn't been endorsed because there's too much NNRTI resistance worldwide, this is a very big advance for prevention. Um, but in HBTN083, and actually specifically also the one year open label extension study uh, in uh, April of 2023, the kind of final HPTN 083 um, breakthrough data was presented. If you did break through on cabotegravir, how much NCD resistance did you have? Curiously, there was none in HPTN 084 with women. So I do think the drug levels are higher there with cabotegravir, but at least in men who assess with men and transgender women, there were total, this is again, the open label too, 34 HIV infections and 29% had uh, NCD mutation. So not worth, uh, you really can't use an NCD yet until you get your genotype back. I totally agree to use Dronavir based regimens while you're waiting. Yeah, what about a non-nuke? I didn't give that option, I don't think. I mean, I think uh, uh, they really, there shouldn't be any effect in a way from a cabotegravir on a non-nucleoside. Like you could use Dronavir, Ritonavir, for example, with Duravirine or something, or even Dolateg. Well, yeah, I guess you could use Ritonavirine. The one thing is there's just a baseline level of NNRTI resistance that's out there, um, and uh, especially in in low and resource, uh, low and middle income countries, it's up to ten percent. In our country, it's lower. It's around depending on the region, three to five percent. So that kind of transmitted NNRTI resistance makes it why Ritonavirine isn't kind of usually. Um, first line after the, but you could, I think, but I'm I'm still a little bit worried. David would know more about NNRTI resistance transmitted. Okay, and here's just a little bit more data. Let's let's go. I think this is the last case. Um, so this is a um, high level resistance issue. So this is a 54 year old guy also having intermittent meth use comes into your clinic from somewhere else. At the time of arrival, pretty advanced infection, um, low CD4 count viral load in the 600,000 range um, back in the day, had exposure to those drugs that you see listed there, basically has been infected with HIV for a while and had lots of different things. In November, um, had things under control with a dolutegravir ropivirine regimen and then got hospitalized uh, in April, uh, now viral load up to a million, and he got switched uh, while in the hospital to boosted uh, darunavir, 3TC, and twice daily dolutegravir. Uh, not, apparently not based on a resistance assay, just deduced. Um, and seemed to have, a, got discharged and over time, viral load went down but it's still hovering in the 500 copy range. So not terribly satisfying. And that goes out to even just a few weeks ago based on this scenario. You get a resistance assay and not too much. You can put them on stavudine if you want. <laughs> Although remember phenotypes are not terribly good for nukes. I'll just say that. Um, but you know, deravirine looks like it might have activity, and uh, but all the all the non nukes are, I mean, all the integrases are resistant, and you can see there's a 148 to 140 uh, present. That in combination is not usually very good, uh, especially if a 155 is also there. We've already talked about the 263. So just to remind you of that, uh, there's a 140 to 148, especially when used together. There's the 155 I mentioned. So now what? This is going to, I'm going to give you a little bit longer to think about this one. Um, and it brings in some new drugs, lenacapavir, fostimzavir, ibilizumab. Um, so there's options. Uh, but what do you do and how can you access it and all that kind of stuff? Real world activity. As Austin Powers would say, I think I've gone cross-eyed. <laughs> so let's see what we got. All right. 
Connie, you were a part of some of these studies. Well, and... I think we've made a, a few of these points already. When you look at that phenotype and the gene accompanying phenotype, it's going to be pretty hard to to get much activity out of uh, an integrase inhibitor. So I'm not sure I see much point in that. Um, so white I think, yeah. <laughs> yeah, white flag. So I think we're now into some of the other drugs we've sort of just briefly touched on, but, you know, and I have to say personally, I'm not a fan of ibilizumab. I think the the logistics of trying to give that drug and the uh, basis for its use um, really isn't robust. And so I don't think I would use option H. So I think I'm more in the category of F or um, E or F with using the, the boosted darinavir, retaining some activity with an NRTI. We've had a several studies that have shown even in the presence of resistance, there may be some modest activity of retaining 3TC in the regimen and then going with lenacapavir and durapirine or lenacapavir and fostemsevir. It's a more complex regimen, but at least you don't have to get into the intravenous in, uh, use of ibilizumab. Mm -hmm. And I, I'll just say anecdotally, for those people who know Yiddish, um, I'm not sure who named this drug, but the term ibl means nauseated. Just saying. <laughs> you, you can look it up, but if it's actually a great word, ibl. I'm nauseated. Ibl. Ugh. So anyway, um, uh, others? Raj, Monica, David? Yeah, I would agree with Connie. I mean, I think you basically tick through your classes, right? The nucleosides, you, you don't have any more. You're not really going to use D4T or AZT and can't really trust them. Um, and in RTIs, even though the genotype said that there was um, some susceptibility or the phenotype, um, I would be a little worried about deravirine mm -hmm. old activity. So I'm kind of tending towards um, F in, the, in that list. Um, you tick through the PIs, you're going to use them. The PIs still work. And then the integrase inhibitors, unfortunately, you've lost. So um, that leaves you with uh, boosted drunavir. I think lenacapavir is solid. And then fostemsevir is a, a very good choice. If if they happen to have R5 tropic virus, which they probably don't, because I think the CD4 count was less than 200, then then maybe, yeah. you know, if you want, want it needed an oral, all oral regimen. But I, I don't even see that as a choice. So I, I think I'm with the majority of people and with Connie with going with that. David, I'm coming to you, but I'm just, it, it, I just—I have to say that when I see a case like this, I get this really terrible feeling, you know, kind of in the pit of my stomach about a guy who's already had trouble with adherence with simpler regimens, and all we can do is kind of throw the kitchen sink, and it doesn't feel good. I mean, you got to do something, but linacapavir is great because it's got a long, long, long half life, can be dosed, you know, up to every six months, and that's encouraging, but you can't anchor solely to that you need some help uh, david i was just going to mention a couple things about fostemsevir because we've actually had a fair amount of experience with it and i would totally underscore and agree with what connie said about ibilizumab it's just logistically every time we've tried to do it very very difficult fostemsevir has a couple pros and cons it's a drug that even though it's an entry inhibitor you do not need to do tropism assay um it's very well tolerated um, it is with or without food, so that's at least good. The cons are, and some people who've not used this, it can prolong QTC intervals. So if you're using it with ropivirine or maybe another drug like methadone, that can be problematic as well, too. And I think the virologic reductions, if you go back to the Bright study and look at this, they're they're good, but they're fairly modest. So this is not in the category we think of like a boosted PI type regimen. Um, so I think it has some pros and cons. The only other con is that it also can interact and in drugs that are uh, inducers in CYP3A can lower fostemsevir levels. So it's not going to be a drug you could pull out for somebody like on, you know, rifampin for, for TB prophylaxis or anything. So it 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 is something that we've had pretty good experience with, and it has been well tolerated. And there's a, a certain genetic change in the virus that makes, what is it, 10, 15 percent not susceptible and yeah i don't know that we can check for that is it you know if there's any genotype available for that now i don't think so 
the studies looked at it, but I don't know that it's commercially available. Monica, these are uh, this is a couple of data slides that I think you sent me nicely. I uh, appreciate that. Do you want to walk us through some of this real quick, especially the Guernica well, painting? <laughs> I only showed Guernica because I think it is it is hard. Uh, like Connie said, uh, ibuluzumab is like my our last option, I think, because it's it's IV, so you have to put it in an IV. You can push it now uh, 30 seconds and not wait a, an hour, but I, this is going to be the least of your options. Um, I think if Maravara could be used, that'd be great. Um, and then lenacapavir, you know, we just got this drug. Uh, it was approved in December 2022, so it's really new. We actually have been using quite a bit of it, um, but uh, it is uh, it's it's exciting because it's a new in class capsid inhibitor. So it's going to be your last, you know, like newest drug, and so it will work for multi drug resistant patients. And that was the study that was done, and MDR HIV was was Capella study. The it, it turns out it was a little more complicated, but you don't have to give the oral dose on day eight. It turns out from PK, so just give the oral dose on day zero one. 600 milligrams, so that's two 300 milligram tablets, and then give the injectable the same day, subcutaneously, two different shots, 927 milligrams, so two shots, can have injection site reactions. But the Capella study did show us, published in the New England Journal um, in the spring, that it did bring down viral loads in patients without with multidrug resistant HIV. And the only other update I'd say is two slides from now, the 52-week data of Capella was just published in Lancet HIV. Um, this was the, the nice, you know, final outcomes. But if you go to the next slide, the 52-week outcomes um, was just published in Lancet HIV. And it is important to say that lenacapavir can never be alone. Uh, if you were either didn't have something in your optimized background or you weren't taking it because they did drug levels, Almost every single person who was just on lenacapavir as kind of monotherapy got lenacapavir associated mutations. So it has to be backed up. In this case, you have the backup of darunavir, uh, ritonavir, but um, and then the other drug you're going to use, but never give it with a kind of half regimen. I think yeah. the other point, Monica, that was raised in the week 52 data as well is that if people had. Uh, background, I guess this is just saying it in a different way, but if you had no, if your optimized background therapy contained no fully active drugs, you right. didn't do well on lenacapavir, even with initial viral suppression, only about- it Has to be fully active. Yeah, only about 60% of people suppressed. And then if you had two or more drugs in your optimized background therapy that were fully active, that's where you got into the nine above 90% suppression. So not only is, is the having drugs to go with it important to prevent resistance mutations, it's also important to the initial activity of the regimen. So we agree in one, yeah. And one other comment about that, if they can't take oral ART, then I would not do lenacapavir because um, in this case, cabotegravir is not going to work because we already eliminated our instes. And if you cannot take that oral, because this is the other thing is they did drug levels and some patients weren't taking the oral regimen, lenacapavir then was not working. Well, this is fabulous. I, I guess we're uh, the take home point, I guess, for those of us who lived through the 60s and 70s, you have to channel your inner Jerry Lewis and tell lenacapavir they'll never walk alone. So they'll always have somebody <laughs> with them. Okay, um, we're at the end of the time. I just wanted to remind everybody, despite the fact that we fret a lot about people with uh, uh, limited treatment options or LTO, in the more modern era, since integrase inhibitors and better therapies, it's really 1% or less. And what's fascinating in this study from Scenix is that even those people who had limited treatment options, if you look over time, uh, limited treatment options out in 2016 and beyond, the virologic response ultimately is similar to those who did not have limited treatment options. And I think we've seen that throughout this, uh, throughout the webinar. So um, the people that give us uh, a lot of uh, nervousness, spilkus, uh, when we see, because they've got these complicated situations and poor adherence that got them to a point where the regimens failed, uh, we got to be able to figure that out. 
So we're kind of at the time uh, to close up. Uh, went by very quickly. The panel, you guys were outstanding. I mean, just really covered uh, the gamut of topics and making great points all along the way. Um, summary is obviously we have to confirm virologic failure. Sometimes it's not failure in the course of a persistent uh, detectable virus that isn't going up above 200. If it does go above 200, um, uh, watch out for uh, things that interfere with drug absorption or metabolism or use, like the divalent cations we talked about, explore. All the prior regimens and use resistance tests to make your next regimen with two fully active drugs, if you can, twice daily dolutegravir in the setting of some uh, integrase inhibitor resistance, although not when it's really robust resistance. Uh, tenofovir might modify at the K65, but we're seeing data now that shows that even in that setting, um, when anchored with a, a powerful, uh, a more powerful drug like uh, integrase inhibitor, uh, does okay. Boosted darunavir, as we talked about, um, the two to three, uh, two or so resistance mutations, it still has pretty good activity. As we mentioned a couple of times, 3TC and FTC, even in those M184V, there can still be about a 0.5 log reduction in virus. And some of the newer drugs come into play in the complicated situations that we talked about. Uh, so uh, post-test, let's see what we got here. Uh, it's the same story. It's the same one we saw. Um, basically, uh, uh, a woman who presents and has a KU65R and M184V, what might you use? Go ahead and vote. Which is least likely to work? Least likely to work. We talked about this. Okay, let's see what we got. Survey says, Richard Dawson. Okay, well, hmm, it's a bad question. Uh, it's, you know, it's a negative, but the adobidine is what we were looking for there because of that uh, the Nadia study that showed that uh had more toxicity issues. So uh, we'll let you go on that one. And then the final question, um, whoops, is uh, uh, someone who you basically, would you order a cellular genotype, yes or no? We talked about this a little bit. You got the opinion of the panel. Um, go ahead and vote. All right, what do we have? Mm, okay, so that's up quite a bit from the original. It was like 50-50 initially, but we talked about why it's not terribly helpful. Um, and we had the answer. So um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating. We're closing right about on time. There's a few... Uh, ending slides here that we'll bring up uh, will tell you about some of the future activities in ISUSA. Again, I want to just thank the panel. It's It's been wonderful. Um, you want to claim CME, uh, you, got, you go online uh, and you will get a uh, uh, your certificate. Um, there's a long-acting drug uh, webinar uh, coming up uh, that's going to talk about uh, those uh, uh, new, we talked about them a little bit today. Next. Uh, there's a number of the whole series now on substance use disorders. You know, the FDA is requiring some certification. Uh, six uh, episodes, if you will, of this with uh, Sandy Springer and Ellen Eaton chairing and lots of great uh, conversation. This will be provided free CME credits so you can participate in this and not have to pay for anything get the certificate. And then we have uh, issues about doxy prep that we'll talk about in later September and cardiovascular issues with the reprieve study. Um, next. Uh, something on RSV and influenza vaccinations. And then we have that one-on-one uh, that I mentioned at the outset um, for people that are new to the field. Thanks very much. And especially thanks to the panel. Uh, just an outstanding job. And uh, greetings from Scotland there, uh, Raj. Appreciate you coming in later in the evening. And thanks to all of you for participating. It's been a great uh, afternoon. Thank you.